Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Alexander Ladd, Senior Partner and CEO of Mindstream Analytics. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Great to having. have you. And I'm excited to dig in on this, this topic. We're talking today about transforming mm -hmm. metrics into organizational momentum. So this is a great topic. I talk a lot about project management and collaboration. I've built project management organizations as a consultant for many years and, uh, and been in the collaboration information management space for a long time. And this topic so, you know, about this, that, what, what are we actually leveraging? Are we leveraging the right things? Mm -hmm. Is a conversation that doesn't happen enough, whether it's a startup, whether it's a long time, massive enterprise, um, this is one of those things like from a Deming perspective, like you should constantly go back and review yeah. have the metrics moved, have they changed kind of things around that. So I, I'm interested to kind of dig into things before you give a more full uh, uh, like introduction of yourself and your company. I was doing some learning as I often do uh, mm -hmm. about your company. You've got three bullets on the front page uh, that really resonate with me my experience is kind of, I just described as a startup founder, as an mm -hmm. operations leader, and even as a project manager, the three bullets. So um, business finance and IT stakeholders are not aligned on the analytical problem, the solution on how to get there or the business case for making a change. That is more often the story rather than being on the same page. Let's start like there. Yeah, the second I would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Business users are challenged to define requirements and bring to light the solutions, vision, and benefits. Yeah, so they, again, yes, we'll get into that. And mm -hmm. then there's too little focus on the most critical success factors, internal, external, digital, syndicated, structured, and unstructured data. Yes. In fact, that's a question I often ask is like, what are the success factors? What does this look like at the end? How are you solving for something that we're not all on the same page on. So with, with that kind of framing the discussion, maybe more about yourself and, and, and your company. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, Mindstream is, Mindstream Analytics, it, uh, we're a consulting firm and we work in the, you know, depending on who you're talking to, it's either the enterprise performance management area or the corporate performance management area, depending on if you're Oracle or SAP versus uh, some of the other players in the market. Um, so, you know, like a one stream or something like that. So we've been in this space for, you know, I've been in it personally for about 25, 26 years. Mindstream has been in it for 15. Uh, and most of the people at Mindstream have been in it for, you know, closer to closer to what I've been in it, you know, in that 20 year mark. Um, you know, so we've, we've seen a lot. We've done a lot. I mean, if, you know, most people, if you've worked in finance, you probably heard the the name of, of software called Hyperion, right? And that was a, that was a big finance software for years and years, it was acquired by Oracle in 07. So, I mean, that's kind of the world, where the ecosystem we came out of. And um, now we work with a few different vendors, but primarily, you know, the two that we work with most are, are Oracle, which, you know, is legacy kind of Hyperion, they acquired it. And then another company called OneStream, um, who is kind of like a newer, they just actually just went public a couple of weeks ago. So it's a newer kind of new next generation uh, version of this software. Uh, but a lot of this is around, my background's really around FP&A um, and driving, you know, the analytics as well as kind of the budgeting and forecasting. And let's make our forecast very accurate. And to do that, we really need to know what's driving the driving the business. So that kind of gets where your analytics comes in. Well, it, again, it's and and not being a finance guy, I think I was I, my, my initial degree program. I did three years of industrial design, so it was very much in the design uh -huh. art world side of yeah. things. That's that, okay. Do, do product design. <laughs> Um, but I, I completely appreciate it. I, it's always funny doing like the organizational uh, personality mm -hmm. tests, like the individual tests, your, yeah. your style, your strengths. Right. You look at the organization, like the analytical one is like the 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 weakest on my skill set, and the one that I have to even for that thin mm -hmm. layer, I have to dig the deepest for yeah. that. 
which is how did I go from all the advanced math classes in middle school to like, like, please just get this away yeah. from all yeah, yeah. Of you to do that. That happens to all of us, I, I think. I mean, I, to yeah. be honest, I was a history major. So, you know, I, you know, not, not anything math related at all. Uh, I've yeah. always loved math, but not, not that much when I got to college. <laughs> but it, it is interesting, though, as I was talking about er, earlier, is it, how consistent as I go as a change management consultant, as a collaboration consultant, uh, and have... It, mm -hmm. There's an idea of like, okay, we're brought in. Clearly, you understand you need these tools, these these systems, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And to how quickly you find out that the organization is not working from the same page. And no. so, what are the key challenges that you see when you start working with organizations uh, on, on how to leverage their data effectively? Um, I mean, are most organizations? I mean, in the high tech world, yeah, there's been a big move over the last decade towards data driven decision making, which is great. Sure, but a lot of other organizations like are, are not on top of that. They're not working that way. So, what are the challenges when you work with customers? Well, I mean, so yeah, I would argue that um, not even within organizations. Are they all working that way, right? So some portions of the organization might be working that way and others aren't, right? Um, you know, I think the challenge is, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things that you talk about with collaboration and stuff like that and everybody being on the same page, you know, um, what finance needs is maybe different than, you know, IT, you know, oh yeah, we have that data. We can give it to you. It's like, no, no, that's, it's it, un understood, but that's only the, like the tip of the iceberg, right? You know, we need it like this or, or you know, something like that, right? There's always small deviations between like, you know, kind of what they think they're providing and kind of what the other side thinks they're getting. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's part of it, I think, right there. And then as you, as you move forward, you know, the availability and things like that, you know, I was actually talking to a CFO uh, recently and he was talking about, Oh, you know, you know, I said, you listen, you, I think you have some data quality uh, concerns you, or you should, because I have them about your data. And uh, he said, no, no, my, our data is fine. And, uh, you know, as a CFO, he's getting the reports, right? He, you know, yeah. the, the, what he's missing is all the people that spend hours in Excel or days, massaging you know, that, massaging right? it yeah. to get it to him. Right. You know, and he's looking at it like, no, the data's fine. I see it right here. It's right here. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. It can be done more easily than you're doing it, right? You know, what's part of the problem that, like, if you've ever seen a demo of, uh, like, you know, seeing demos now I've been in, uh, in it for over 30 years. And so like, I look at it and be like, okay, that's really cool. And yeah. how much of that was real, how much it was smoke and wire holding things together. Yeah. Because when you go look at things like uh tableau power BI, yeah. uh, you know, you, you look at the platforms like that and they build these brilliant data visualizations, oh, yeah. they move things around and yeah. you're like, this is excellent. And then you go and you purchase the licenses, you look mm -hmm. at your data and you're like, uh, I, I can't get anything that looks like, you know, that, yeah. that more than a four-year-old worked on this, yeah. like it, to, to get it there. So much data massaging, so yeah. much that, yeah. that has to happen to get it to the point where you yeah. can then go pull it into a visualization tool and do things with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I would even say look, before you get into the, the, you know, one of the things that, you know, and I think this kind of became a hot topic for a while and then kind of was cooled off. But I feel like um, it's cooled off. It's not as buzzworthy, let's say. But there's still so many companies that don't understand it or don't do it well. And that is really around master data. You know, so like what's the definition of your data or your data dictionary or whatever you want to call that or translate that to, right? And, you know, so many people, like there are companies that do it well. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot that don't. And, and then they kind of started talking about it and maybe they got fatigued by it or whatnot. And then they kind of gave up on it. Right. And so, you know, now they still don't have it defined well. Um, and I think that that becomes a huge thing because before you can even really offer the data in that rich analysis or that beautiful heat map or whatever, you know, kind of comes out of Tableau. Right. So they have some, like some scattergrams that are just in scatter diagrams that are just incredible, you know, but like to get there you have to define everything and make sure everything matches together, right? And to do that is a significant effort, um, especially when you get into um, finance and things like that. I mean, finance is very particular about their um, 
uh, about their data and, and what the definitions are and things like that is, you know, I mean, they have to be, they have to tell the auditor, right? So the, their definitions have to be pretty, um, pretty rigid. You know, the first third of my career, I was in like the data warehousing world. I worked for Pacific Bell way back, you know, back in the nineties yeah. and, and before that for EDS, a lot of, you know, what we did was, you know, working with clients to identify the data that needed to be merged. And of course, you know, back then you had, it was so expensive and the performance mm -hmm. in the internet was not what it is today and the connectivity right. between. And so. Um, you know, these were massive amounts of data and move them across, but the problems there were the same. It's like, you, you need to have that data di dictionary. You need yes. to understand the information architecture, where the location was, mm -hmm. and then to bring these things together. I mean, I worked every day around people with the title of DBA at different levels and yeah. moving this stuff around to give the end users. And then of course, all the front end tools, the, the mm -hmm. SAS modules, business objects, you know, yep. DSS agent, I mean, kind of yep. all these different tools to go in there and do that. Yeah. But again, was I learned very early that it wasn't just about going and looking at that raw data that how yeah. much effort was around that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and that's always been, you know, as the, it, even as all these data warehouse tools um, advance, you know, there's generation and next generation and things like that. There's still like, they still kind of get stuck on that point because at some point you can't automate that, right? You need human interaction. So, I mean, that comes down to like, you know, what you're talking about, the collaboration between all these different groups to kind of come up with these definitions and things like that. Do, do you, with your clients, do you have to have a unified approach to data management or like across business units and departments? Is it something where you can have like very different views of that data? Yeah, yes, we can. And actually, you know, um, so this gets into like kind of that generation I was, I was mentioning one stream as you, you talk about these things, when you talk about like performance management solutions, a lot of them, and, and you know, people have probably heard of these things over, but um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the term OLAP, which is like a cube, right? Yep. And people slicing and dicing and things like that. And like, as you get, you know, into these next generations of these tools, you're starting to realize that, well, everything's not nice and contained within one cube, right? You might have multiple, or you might have um, slightly variant uh, kind of combinations of those like dimensionality and things like that. And so this, the, like the newer generation of these tools takes that into account and it's a much better fit for, you know, either like a conglomerate that has different lines of business or any business that has, you know, different operating structures, whether that be because of geography, whether that be because of, you know, business lines or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, but now they handle that so much more efficiently. And, you know, that's where you get into like all these KPI discussions about what's actually driving all these things. And, I, you know, and actually, um, you know, one of the things that I have been you know, kind of blown away within the last few years is everybody's starting to talk about AI as I'm sure you get people on here with that. And then, you know, as you, that, that kind of came after a little bit of people talking about machine learning. And I always think about the distinction between the two is one's textual and one's numeric. That's the way I kind of think about well, it. Well, right? and the, before that was, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of vendors talking about big data, which is yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the generic, yeah. I don't just like, you know, when, when has this ever not been about big yeah, data? It's always it's been all the same stuff. Like, like, right. yeah, I mean, when you talk about like OLAP, nobody brings up OLAP, ROLAP, MOLAP, like all the variations yeah. of that. Yeah. But, but I think I was about to make the comparison saying that people are starting to understand why mm -hmm. like you could always have an, an an ai you know running locally and to your data and there's like microsoft has that with copilot the ability to go and build you know focused smaller uh you know uh, your own copilot instance around that mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. but people generally understand that the volume of data that you're accessing especially through the consumer ai tools yeah. um it you know, requires so much processing so much that's out there you can only do it through the internet which you know is kind of what was happening with back 30 years ago 25 years ago with these olap rollap platforms that were yeah. it was i worked with a company called i don't know if they're still out there objectivity because we were building object-oriented data databases that mm -hmm. were so massive that yeah. relational databases couldn't handle them you yeah. know and and it's like the internet wasn't yet ready. This was 24 years ago, 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. The internet wasn't in a place where it could even help yet with that. 
Right. And, you know, so we had a partner with IBM and uh, Connection, which was a hosting uh, a provider yeah. there and connectivity to build these massive models. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you think about like the talking about big data and, and you know, it was always big, you, you know, you were working on data that was too big for the the kind of the technical capacity that we had at the time. And I feel like yeah. we're always kind of the data is always a little bit ahead of where we are. You know, I, I, mean? I actually time, managed the server, so I was well aware of what we yeah. could do. And hey, we need there was always the request is, yeah, we need more servers for this. Right, right. Yeah. Always, always. And, you know, you still get it. It just takes a different form now, right? We still need, now you can just kind of spin them up on the cloud and that's great, but you still just consuming more and more and more as you go, yeah. right? So and for folks out there, it's like, yeah, it can scale. Yeah, you will pay for that scale. Yeah, but yeah it can exactly. scale. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's, it, it's really uh, an interesting thing. So but, uh, talking about the, the application of this, I, I think that's a good, hopefully give people kind of a baseline mm -hmm. for what, what we're talking about with this. Uh, so talking about companies that are starting to leverage this, this data. Um, so especially around, again, being in IT, uh, thinking about innovation in an organization, when you go and work with the client, mm -hmm. I mean, they generally have a clear idea of what they're trying to accomplish, or is that part of the process? Does it, do they kind of change their focus uh, when they start looking at the analytics of what they need to go in and measure and track to? That's a great question. And, and I think that that goes back to that uh, machine learning stuff, because, you know, one of the things when you get into these statistical models is it's going to show you what it's using or what, why it's weighting things differently. Right. And so what the, the run rates are of different pieces that are impacting the model or the variations. Right. And that's where you get into, you know, you, you said at the beginning, like startups don't maybe they don't know what their KPIs yet. Or whereas like kind of older, you know, well-established companies that have been using the same KPI for the last 50 years. And, you know, that's what they use. Whereas maybe the business has changed a little bit and that's not the proper driver anymore. And that's where I think you see in the, some of these statistical models, that's where you can start to piece out kind of where these other drivers are coming into play and showing it. Some of them, yeah, it's still the same. That's great. You know, um, but, you know, some of them have new things that are being impact, uh, that are impacting them a lot. And I think that that's something that um, is, is just fun to find out. I mean, um, how, but how much do organizations, I mean, you talk about that, that they, they start to realize that, hey, we're not measuring the same things, but mm -hmm. change is hard. I mean, as I go in the type of consulting that I totally. do is, I mean, they, they push back. It's like, hey, you hired me to come in. We've identified yeah. these areas and now you're yeah. fight, pushing back against yeah. the, this need for change. So how do I organizations think... ensure that they're, they've got that change management model that, that they're constantly looking, not just collecting data, but change management data. Means so many different things. And, and I agree with you. Like, I don't know that anybody has a, a hundred percent sure, assured model that they have change management baked into their organization. Um, I mean, you can talk about a couple of companies that, um, that I look at from the outside cause I haven't worked with them that you, that look like they do like a Google or something like that. But, you know, um, but even there, I'm sure that that exists, right? It's just human nature to kind of settle into your comfort zone, right? Well, um, com companies are people and it's usually yeah. driven by somebody who gets it and then yeah. they move on to a different role or a different company yeah. and suddenly there's a vacuum of that leadership mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. the passion for that change exactly. management. Exactly. It's hard to keep that, right? And yeah. I mean, when we get into companies, you know, to answer your question, I mean, some of them will change things and some of them are, you know, the ones that, uh, I know a project's going to be successful, you know, based on how I'm seeing the the initial couple weeks or whatever. And you can tell who's open to change and who's not, right? Yeah. And so you can see this is always, we got to do it this way because we've always done it this way. Well, that, that's probably the worst justification you've ever heard in your life, right? Yeah. Um, because it, it, like right there, you know, you're in trouble. Uh, but, you know, that's that's where we see, that's what we see. Um, and And change management means so many things to so many people. And you, you, you talk about project management, you mentioned project management, right? And change management is a piece of that, right? But um, it, it also just generally within the company being open to, open to all kinds of things, you know? Um, you can always tell because, you know, especially when we go in, you know, we work with a lot of, like we work with a couple of pieces of software and if you get in there and somebody was really pitching a different one that they wanted, you can tell that right away, right? And they're just, yeah. they're going to be against this right from the get-go, no matter yeah. what we do, right? So it, it's always... Uh, an interesting kind of uh, reading the room type situation. 
That's always the uh, some of my favorite examples of that are the uh, you know the CEO who read an in flight magazine and heard about something and now wants to go and implement. That's one. And then the other one, even the more common scenario is that um, like company hires a new CIO to make change to shake yeah. things up. I, yeah. I was the consultant uh, uh, who was brought in as a CIO to do exactly that, knowing that it would be a in an under two year gig. Like they hired him strategically, knowing that he was going to burn bridges, upset a lot of people, but yeah. that this change, painful change needed to happen. Yeah. And he was gone in less than a year and a half. Yeah, no, that happens. And I mean, that happens. And, you know, I mean, like at the end of the day, no matter what the, like you mentioned, the CEO, the CEO that read something in Flight Magazine, that happens. But even yeah. if it, this is thought out and have gone through, you know, you mentioned demos, like, you know, everybody's going to buy into a demo and what's real at, at different levels. Right. And so, you know, and you're going to see six or seven of them if you're if you're looking through different products. Right. To, to try and find something for yourself. And, uh, you know, people are going to disagree on which one you should have. And, and depending on where they sit and how hard they believe or disbelieve is going to be, you know, it's going to be a challenge. Um, it, that is, you know, the collaboration thing is an interesting thing as a consultant. Right. Because we're the consultant coming in. So, you know, we're, we're, we're obviously the bad guys right off the bat. Right. So, um, you know, so it's always, it's always a challenge that way because um, you want to talk to them, you want to tell them what's, what's good and what's not, but at the same time have to be careful about trying to win them over first. Right. So. Well, another part of that too is, is balancing that need, but between, because if you're brought in on a specific project, Hey, we need these insights. We need to make this change. Mm -hmm. If you're brought in by one business unit, um, a lot of times, again, my experience is that they struggle to look beyond the short-term needs of like that, you know, that initiative yeah. versus, hey, yeah. here's what we need to be doing that's just healthy for the collection of, of data. Mm -hmm. I, how much time do you spend on helping them improve kind of their, you know, uh, um, their their data infrastructure cleanup, their their processing what data they should be collecting to get that level set to be able to do things that maybe the project that you're brought in for doesn't even cover but long term sets them on the right path to do more a lot a lot and that kind of goes back to your like successful engagements and things like that right because you know that's one of the things you you when you get there then you start to, to, to dig under the covers. You know, I, I would say, I would challenge the customer side of things from a, you know, how much is real in the demo, but then how much of what you've told me about requirements are real too, right? Oh yeah, we've got all our data. Well, no, right. you, do you? <laughs> like, you know, I, mean, there's, I always use the phrase, right? like, when you ask somebody for requirements, I started as a business analyst 30 years yeah. ago. When, yeah. you, when you ask someone for the requirements, they're giving you their requirements through their lens of understanding today. Exactly. And so, and that's why I was always, I'm always wary of showing the, like the latest, greatest technology mm -hmm. that the company's clearly not ready for. Right. And then you ask them their requirements and they're going to ask for a bunch of unrealistic stuff. And there's, there's exactly. no right they're answer to that. It's, yeah. it, that's why it's a process. It's not just mm -hmm. a fill out the survey. Let's collect this information and go. Yeah. We always try to start with like a, you know, what is it? Uh, crawl, walk, run kind of, yeah. you know, thought process, right? Let's just get to phase one and get you something successful that helps you. And maybe it's not everything you, you know, wish and desire, but let's just get something going that works and, and helps, right? And then we can work on the next piece and the piece after that and whatever, and that's fine. And if you, do, I mean, if not, that's all you need, great. That's all you need. But I mean, it, it's, it's just one of those things because you do spend, you can easily, create, you know, kind of project failure, if you will. And failure is kind of a tough word there, but, um, you know, by by trying to bite off more than you can chew or trying to shoot, you know, a bridge too far. We're going for a bridge too far. Let's make sure we dial it back and, and do something that we can achieve within the time frame that you have, right? right. Um, because you're right, we end up doing a lot of that. And, and you're right about what you can show and things like that, because, you know, you've shown the, 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 the we actually have a, a uh, a vendor we work with now and they they we talk to them about that like you can't show this demo you know what i mean it's great demo. don't get me wrong i love it love what you know what it shows etc but you can't show that to, to this group of people because they're, they're going to want that 
and they need they're not ready for that you know they, they need there, there's so many things that have to happen before they can get to that point right yeah. so let's just let's just dial it back a little bit just give me about like 50 percent of your capabilities the, the easy 50 and we'll kind of then we'll, we'll add that other stuff later that's the the problem with being a consultant um especially in the it mm -hmm. field is that you're you fight that battle of you know, every, uh, every OEM you work with, in my case, I work in the Microsoft ecosystem. Every time they yeah. go talk about something, you yeah. know, yeah. something new and it'd be yeah. like, and then people come back and it, it wrecks whatever sales process you're on. You might be in the, oh, yeah. uh, you know, the ninth month of a 12 month sales cycle and it could scuttle that entire effort because exactly. they're excited about something that really won't be real for two years out. Right. I, I realize things are moving very quickly, but I, I uh, personally, as a guy who's undergrads in marketing, I'll say marketing people are really good at adjusting their uh, their sales pitch, their marketing around the, the actual delivery date. Like I, example, like Microsoft was talking about stuff that you know, they used to be on like every three, four years, you get an yeah. upgrade to a piece of software. And with the evergreen, with the cloud, they would talk about things and people like, oh yeah, so we'll get it in a couple of years. It's like, three months later, it's there. So it all accelerated. Uh, yeah. But the marketing adjusted to that. And now they are back to talking about things that are a year or two late. So, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I exactly. wish people, I wish customers better understood that. Like, you, you yeah, to, to look, it's great to be forward thinking and look at where the technology is going. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, and you know, and my favorite example of that is like a user conference. You know, you go to the user conference and they tell, look at all this stuff, and, you know, and then yeah. the, you, then the day after you get six calls from customers or more. And, then, and it's like, well, we want that. It's yeah. like, well, you know, I, I don't really think it exists yet, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that it, I always try to, as, as someone who presents regularly at conferences and talk about, here's the versions, here's the licenses, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that caveat has to be there. These totally. things are in preview. We have no... Yep data yep. for a GA of this yep. I mean, all that kind of thing. You have to do that to ground yeah. them in reality. No, but, yeah. it, but I think of this, I, I think a great analogy to all this is like, uh, uh, you know, NASA and the space race. There's, you have the goal of we're like Kennedy, we're going to put a man on the moon mm -hmm. and out of it, you get all of these other changes, all these other products and services and yeah. benefits of reaching that goal yep. that were never part of your plan, but are positive benefits, you know, out other outcomes oh, yeah. of huge going down that that path. Yeah. Yep. Um, but if you are not, I mean, you might look at it and say, well, this getting to the moon is you know taking forever. Like, yeah, it's or now it's getting to Mars is you know taking yeah. forever yeah. On, you know, on that path. But yeah, but look at everything else and how we're benefiting. It's like, but you have to be, you have to keep yeah. your eye on what changes are happening. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree with that. And, and I, and I also totally agree with, you know, you got to make sure you're looking at the things that are coming out of it. And that kind of goes back to, it's hard to sit there and say, well, I want all this, but I'm willing to bite off these little pieces as I get to get there. Right. And, um, but that's really, I, I think that that's really the secret sauce. I mean, the customers I have that implement these pieces that end up with this system that you're like, wow, that is really advanced and fantastic. And, and everything is, those are the people that took the time to go step by step, you know, and all right, I can, I can get to here now. So let's do that. And then I can get to there. And like, you know, I mean, I, you know, and these are the people that you sit down with and if they really get it, they'll sit with you and say like, Oh no, no, I want all this, but I know my users can't digest that yet. Or I, I'm not mature enough, but let's just get comfortable with what we're going to do, you know, the first round and then we'll continue to do it. And that's where, you know, the people that end up with all these really cool, like cool systems that can do all these th wonderful things, they're the ones that take the time to go kind of piece by piece and and, and get there and, and be patient uh, to get there. But they did, it, you know, and then they end up there. And that's really, you know, ultimately, that's really the, the, um, the secret, you know, because um, you can't, it, I just see these, these so many projects where we're going to do all of this, you know, and, and then it just almost collapses under its own weight. Right. right. And, and there's so much risk on the, on the delivery date and the budget and all these things. It's like, you know, let's just move this down a notch and do these little pieces and we'll get where you need to go. And the other, because the other thing is those people that do that, 
get those side benefits. You know what I mean? And that's where you get all these values, right? And you look back and you're like, oh, I should have started going after all this. Yeah, but you didn't know that you were going to get all these little side pieces, right? right. You didn't know you were going to develop Velcro or, or, you know, sticky notes along the way or whatnot, right? You know, these are, these are things that just fell out along the way. You know, we have some great customers that were going to use the tool and, you know, certain tools in this particular fashion. And as they got more comfortable that, you know, they realized, hey, I could also do this, this, and this. And like, yeah, you could. And yeah. oh, that's great. And now they have, you know, this thing that look, at the end, you look back and like, oh, that's so fantastic. But was it, it wasn't architected that way to begin with. It just kind of grew that way, you know? So, I mean, well, getting comfortable with things is a good idea. I, but I think part of it too is, it, again, it goes back to having, uh, you know, a, a culture, an organization or a leader that recognizes that, hey, we have a project to go and deliver that will yep. get us to here. And so we might bring in a consulting company. We might have a bunch of contractors that we build up to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I was, you know, very grateful. I had a, uh, a, a very strong IT leader mm -hmm. uh, that she specifically I mean, sat down the PMs at the time, the project managers that were owning different aspects of this. And we were a shared services team, yeah. uh, you know, across this very large organization, over a hundred thousand yeah. employees. Uh, and uh, uh, to, to say that it's like, I don't like, we're not going to have the funds for these contractors. Um, mm -hmm. We worked with um, IGS and EDS and a, mm -hmm. a couple other comp consulting companies. Um, like, but we need to learn from them and how do we replicate the process of what they're doing? How do we scale that? So yeah. ongoing, we then have that ability that was built into our project to do that. So it was yeah. culturally like we were focused on that. When you go in and work with clients around this, I mean, what are the conversations around, you know, scaling this? I mean, we've been talking about, um, you know, the change management model, how do we make it so we repeat this and are looking at these other things, but how do you scale that? What are the critical factors that an organization should look at so that they can have that sustainable growth? It's not just this spike around this one yeah. project because you're there helping us. Yep. How do we sustain that and have that ongoing success? Yeah, you know what? So I think that some of the critical factors are number one, be, you know, you got to look in the mirror and be 100% honest with what your skill sets are internally. Like you yeah, just yeah. mentioned your internal shared services team. Like you got to look at what the skill, the real skill set there is, you know, is it strong in, in, in what area, et cetera. And then be willing to like, you know, one of our most successful customers right now is a company and they, you know, we gave them the original estimate for the work that they had asked us to look at, et cetera, and, and bid on. And they came back to us and said, well, we want to put one of our people as one of your project members. So take one of your people out. And, you know, I, we, we, we talked about it and I said, listen, I'm willing to do that and that's fine. But, you know, the people you're replacing have, you know, over a decade of experience doing this and, and, and so on. And you're replacing them with a person who's a programmer and that's great. I'm sure they're a great programmer, but they've never programmed in this and they don't know the structures, et cetera, et cetera. So they're going to have, you know, there's going to be some ramp up time, et cetera. So I don't think you can go with a one-to-one -one replacement you know, and, and whatever. And so, you know, we kind of agreed, with, let's, let's try it and we'll see where we get to and, and, and whatever. And they, you know, they held up their end of the bargain. It was great. And, um, but, you know, and there were some ramp up issues and we kind of ended up somewhere in the middle, um, you know, probably closer to, to their, their, their liking than, um, than what, you know, I mean, the one taking one person out is, I, I forget the amount of dollars, but, you know, it, it, we probably ended up a, a little bit below, um, half of that amount, you know, and um, so they were they were pretty happy with that. But the, what they really became happy with was they then owned it, and going forward, they could make their changes. Now we're still engaged with them, but every time we do a project, our engagement level gets less and less and less and less. Right. So you know, now they just come to us about, well, is this the right direction, et cetera, and stuff like that. And that's that's fine, and that's a great. That to me is, you know, but if you, you got to look and be honest with what your skill set is and what you know at the beginning. So to me, the critical success factor is one, be honest with what your skill sets are, but also two, be honest about, can you, can you do what you just said? Can you, can you uh, accumulate knowledge in, internally? Are people going to like take this on? Are they going to get engaged? Do you have that kind of collaborative change management um, culture, right? Because, you know, can they, do they want to learn something new? You know, because there's a ton of people out there that don't, um, which right. is always shocking to me, but it, yeah. it, 
it's true. Um, and so uh, those are the things that I think, you know, and those are all, it's so funny because we started this conversation about like math and being good at numbers and things like that, but none of that has anything to do with numbers. <laughs> no, no, it's, it, it no, it's that, that's what's funny. I mean, I, so I have, uh, you know, I mean this, and we we're obviously, we're talking about, um, you know, there's technology, there's process and yeah. there's culture. And so much of this is the cultural aspects. I have another uh, a weekly show that I do that's around mm -hmm. project management called the Project Failure Files, where we, it's largely, we talk about, it's about cultural, talking to people, yeah. working out problems. Um, and I mean, early in my career, it was really frustrating to have to deal with a lot of that stuff. I'm like, I was the yeah. young kid on on the mm -hmm. team, the you know, young PM and with people that had been in, in, in the space for 25 plus years. And I was frustrated by this, you know, like, like go to, like, we know our jobs, we know our roles we have it here at Flavine, do your job kind of thing. And yeah. to go and, and understand, um, Hey, there's people and there's stories behind that. And there's, there's experience, um, and pushing people in the wrong way. You know, there's ways to work with certain people and understand differences between them and, and teams, yeah. kind of all those different factors, all those things are still at play here. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's things that you have to think about. I, as much as I, I got, I always say my co-host of the other show, um, we always mm -hmm. both have kind of a simple phrase, like, I don't care what methodology you use, but follow at least loosely a methodology, have mm -hmm. something that you yep. systematically kind of go through. Mm -hmm. So I, like, is that when you go in, uh, do you find organizations that don't have a methodology at all and you're having to help them that they're leaning more heavily on you or you're having to adjust yeah. to theirs yeah I, I think there is a mix um i i feel like the minority are the ones that have something and they're very strong in their belief in that that methodology and they want us to conform to their methodology which we you know we're fine to do that it just i just don't think that there's you know you're under a third of the companies that have that i think you know yeah um, and some of them really then you run into that mix of like they really want to have it but they don't but they think they do you know kind of thing or right. you know and it's like and then um and, and i i don't mean to beat beat up on agile but you know agile is one of those things and and yeah. oh, you're agile oh, are you <laughs> like you know because that gets you know i mean um that can be you know we're agile but you're going to do all you're going to come up with all the stories you're going to come up with all this and that and it's like well then now you, you just basically cut off one of the, the primary tenants, right? You, you're the interaction between, you know, the people that are going to and be using it and the people that are developing it, right? You got to have, both of them have to be on that page to, yeah. to make it work, right? And, you know, so, yeah, I think people will depend on us to do that. I would say we have a methodology. I would, you know, can it get better? I mean, project management can always get better, right? I, I kind of feel like, right? Um, but, you know, that's, it, it, that's a... Uh, um, that's one of those things you always continue to, to continue and strive to work on and improve. Well, that's again, from a, even if you have a methodology, I mean, it, it will change over time. You have to recognize mm -hmm. uh, the, the cultural impacts of, of that and the change that happens. So even if you have a strong uh, project management method, change management methodology yeah. in place, and there's, there's, I've worked for organizations that had very strong it and corporate governance structure in place mm -hmm. um but you even then you need to as part of those ongoing projects just like the innovation that happens with nasa around you know, the yeah. space program um you it, things might go in a new direction that you weren't expecting i mean you yeah. uh, the the culture of end users i mean we have now we're talking all about uh, millennials and and gen zers two of my kids are millennials two of my kids are gen zers and and uh and we, we've had these conversations where they feel they operate more like a Gen Xer than they do with with people that are they're like their worth that work ethics sure. and things around that. But um, but even then, there's there's cultural differences. There's uh, geographical cultural oh, issues yeah, and yep. styles. And then there's changes in technology, kind of all those things. These are all factors that are constantly um, pushing against that methodology it's why you need to on a regular basis be in reviewing like we do it this way today does it remain the best way or how can we improve this yeah 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I mean, and we, and that's actually one of the reasons I love having customers that have a strong foundation in it because, and, and at them asking us to conform to theirs, because that's where you're going to learn something new, right? On the project management side of it, right? So, you know, oh, this is how you're doing this. Oh, you know what? That actually works really, really well. We're going to, incorpor we're going to start incorporating that or something like that, right? Because, you know, I always think of our, our own personal methodology is, is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it has, uh, it's loosely has some agile components that we've just added because they just, they work super well, right? But like, but overall, I would not call our methodology agile, right? Um, so, I mean, and, and that's the other thing I think that is something you run into is kind of internal politics. So IT might have a, a good basis in something, but, you know, we're building a, a piece of a software. We're building a solution for finance, right? And so yeah. what's finance? Do they believe in what IT is using? Are they going to participate? Because there's a lot of companies where, like, IT is right on your side. This is the methodology we're going to use, et cetera. But, you know, marketing or, or finance or, or sales or whoever you're talking to doesn't necessarily buy into that. And, you know, that can be a problem too, right? That, that was That's a great segue. My next question was... Uh, hey, can you share your thoughts on the importance of collaboration between departments, IT, finance, yeah. um, sales and marketing, all, all of those? Because, again, where it works the best, in my experience, is where you have representatives that are there. Because, yeah. uh, you know, from the IT side, often we do things where we're like, hey, no impact to sales and sales. Be, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Actually, yeah. here's how this we think this looks like it'll impact this. The yeah. way that we're doing it, it might be like how they're getting the data, the frequency of it, or the tie, the integration. You know, yep. they're closely watching between marketing and sales and their metrics around that. Um, so, giving those other departments visibility into what we were doing over in IT was essential because we often missed things that we didn't think that there was an impact. Right, right, and you know, and that kind of goes back to like that whole thing about like I was talking about that customer that like you know, put one of their people in the, on the project team. And, you know, I mean, I feel like that's like the get involved aspect of it. Right. You know, so, I mean, they both have to be in the room. They both have to be talking, you know, well, maybe not both, maybe more than two, you know, but like, yeah. you know, all the different department areas that you're impacting, you know, you got to come to the table and, um, and you have to be present at it and, and, you know, be involved. And there's a lot of times where you get to companies where, you know, okay, go over there and build this for me and come back and tell me when it's done. And it's like, well, that's going to be, you know, we, I can, we can do that, but that's going to be the least impactful, right? Because first of all, you know, the only knowledge uh, like transfer or what your takeaway is going to be is whatever the training material ends up being, right? And that can be positive or, you know, usually that's not as much as you'd glean if you're in it and you're active. Also, to your point, like there's going to be impacts that nobody, they might not know it's going to impact you, right? If you're not there at the table telling them, right? You know, you have to be there. So, I, I mean, the, the get involved aspect of that is huge. Um, you know, and I know everybody's busy, but it, it's, it's real easy to say that you're too busy and you'll make the next meeting, um, you know, and you didn't make this, you know, but that's, that's, a, that's a disaster waiting to happen, right? Because you're not paying attention to what direction the train's moving in. Well, I could go down that rabbit hole of talking about, uh, you know, governance bodies and pulling people together right. and things, tricks that we would do, like, getting when decisions were made, getting them to put their actual physical signature on, yeah. Uh, yeah. on, on a document yeah. and the pushback yeah. we got, okay, we're not moving forward until everyone's agreed like that. Or yeah. we would say, hey, people, if you don't have a representative from your team at this meeting, um, meaning like you, no questions asked or you don't send somebody to the meeting where the agenda is all in advance, like that means compliance. That means you agree with what we've, the decision, the plan we're moving forward. Well, I never said that. It's like, well, then where was your team? Why were yeah. they not there? Um, yeah. But again, that's that's a whole discussion around around that. But yeah. I, I would like to talk more on the on the tech side uh, with, we talked about, I mean, early on um, mm -hmm. with, with all the, you know, data science space has changed so dramatically over the years, moving from, oh, oh Yep. You know the 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 OLAP and the data warehousing to the uh, to the to the big data problem and all those vendors mm -hmm. uh, into mm -hmm. kind of where we are now and moving towards with with AI. What trends do you see that are emerging in that field of data integration in analytics? Is there anything that you really 
excited about that you think is just changing the way things are done? Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest with you, you know, we talked about Tableau and Power BI and things like you, know, you mentioned that and like, but like just the way people are incorporate, like the way people are incorporating the data and consuming it is is changing, you know. And so yeah, yeah, you can build pretty charts and graphs and things like that. But nowadays, you know, there's there's more. Um, I almost feel like there's there's more like bite size. They want more bite sized small pieces at yeah. different points, right? And and um, you know, like you, natural language, like these LLM models can can help with that, you know. So just give me. What's what's the sales in Boston today or whatever? You know, I mean, it, just right. little queries like that that are so finite that, you know, haven't been, you know, like now you're getting down to the concentration on that. You know, when you think about these OLAP models, right, it's all about I can drill down and I can slice and dice. But you don't do you have to do that anymore. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you're getting right. to a point where you don't. You know, I mean, it's just it, you just ask. It's there, you know. And so like hooking them all up is is challenging. But um, but that's where, you know, that, that consumption is changing, um, you know, years and, you know, I wanted reports and then you, you had dashboards. But what was the adoption level of dashboards and how far did people get? Some people got really far. Other companies, you know, there's still people that are well, we're, we're doing it now, you know, and so, OK, um, you know, but but and now you're getting into the even further with like just really um, kind of point in time, like questions and, and, and things like that, that you don't need an OLAP model. You don't need a, a full dashboard. You don't need a full report for things like that, you know, and that's where I, I, I'm, you know, kind of, it's really interesting because that's where you start to replace the army of analysts, right? You know, you don't need an analyst that's going to come up with the answer to six different questions that you had, right? You're going to need just, you know, it's going to be there. My worry with that is going to be kind of, how do you train the next generation to be you know, to get the experience that the people now have, right. That, that have yeah. been doing it for a long time. Right. So. But it's also, I mean, part of the problem, I mean, I just had a conversation earlier today. He said, we were talking about search, like the problem of like search of information yeah. of all of your data. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I don't think, I mean, AI is one of those things again, Hey, we'll point the AI on it. And it'll just find the right data. It's like, no, no. there's more that there, the classification, the information architecture, the, all of the things that you were doing 25 years ago for your massive amounts of data, we have a hundred X, the volume of complexity of that data, that content, yeah. the things that are out yeah. there. And so your ability to go in and exclude data, to remove that from it, to improve processing, but it also AI doesn't know the difference between the quality of any of the data it's going to provide you. Ask for a summary, it'll provide a summary, but you want, half of the summary for that training of the AI to come from data that you know is bad. No, you want, you need to right. remove that. You need to, which goes back to yep. understanding your data. What are we actually collecting? And then having process where you're keeping it fresh and clean. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the AI will help you build the query faster or build the query more easily because you can ask it just to do it. Right. And it will do right. it but you still have to interpret it. You're not, you know, like you don't have, and that's why, you know, I really think that there's a difference between like machine learning versus kind of what people are thinking of AI, which is like more of like the large language model, right? And the large language model is really more interpreting text into, you know, gathering data, right? And then the 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 predictive or the, the you know, the machine learning is really more around statistical and data evaluation and things like that, which again, you still need a lot of integration to get there because, you know, th those models, are only as good as what you give it. S same with AI, right? You know, and um, however, you're not to the point yet where one can kind of build the other or whatnot, right? You know, you can't you can't get there yet, and so you still have a large problem of, of kind of doing doing the analysis of what's right and what and, and you know what's good data, what you should be excluded. What? How do you know that? Well, the, the machines can't tell you that yet. Yeah. So you still need that, right? And um, and you know, again. What data really, you know, I want to join this, you know, like this large data set with this one to get a, get some kind of machine learning. Well, you, you still have to do the regression to see if, if it works, right? Is, does it truly impact it the way you think it will and stuff like that? And that kind of goes back to the, you know, you, you'll find different uh, drivers of things when you do that, right? And that's the, I mean, to me, that's a very interesting part of the whole thing. That's a, uh, I mean, I have a, I work with a lot of engineers that we have these conversations about. Um, you know, not, uh, um, you know, understanding how 
the technology works is mm -hmm. core understanding like well then what do i need to go and test how much should i trust of the result uh, around this like it it's a i mean ai it is i mean my personal experience with using the consumer grade solutions i'm mm -hmm. not doing the scientific research i'm not a data That's scientist yeah. i got two two of my kids that are in data science they do that stuff yeah. um they're in there with r and python and doing yeah, things yeah, that are exactly. incredibly boring to me but anyway um uh, it but understanding, I mean, how those things work, you know, affects then how you uh, approach that. As you're working with uh, with leaders, I mean, I, I imagine that's a big part of this. It's not just, again, going in and setting up the technology and say, okay, what do you, what what are you trying to do? Let's mm -hmm. build these analytics. Here's what you go and do. Do you, how much time do you spend explaining how these pieces work together and yeah. how they need to keep that tuned, refined? A lot. A lot. And, and it, you know what? It's funny because you spend a lot of time it, it, uh, explaining that, but you also spend a lot of time. I guess this falls into that, you know, under the umbrella of explaining that, because the other thing you end up doing is is talking about like, no, it, it can't do that yet. You know, because everybody right now is AI, AI, AI. Can I hook up AI and it'll just do all this for me? It's like, well, it'll do some of that, but not all of that. You know, yeah. so there's a lot aspect of, you know, when you talk about how it works, there's a lot of Hey, can we, you know, and, and we have some clients that we're attaching AI to some things that, that, you know, you know, and they know it's kind of experimental, you yeah. know, will even work well, it, you know, technically it, it should, um, you know, we can't, you know, I can't guarantee that the results are going to be everything you hope it will be right. Um, you know, cause everybody loves to think that AI, uh, is here and it's, you know, they, they, you know, everyone hears AI and they think of how. Right. And maybe I'm dating myself with space obviously, but you know, like that. Yeah. But that's what they think, right? And and it it's it's not that's not what exists yet. You know, it's not a thinking machine, right? It's you know, it it, it can help a lot, but it's not quite that level. So I just last week I was giving a presentation where I was talking about made an AI reference and in my slide I had the how I oh, pop yeah. up there. So <laughs> That and then the next one was the Terminator, you know, right, 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 just right. the exoskeleton, <laughs> you know, that, which is also as part of the same future, which is our right. future. I mean, we're right, just, right. yeah, I mean, it'll probably get yeah. there, but it's, it's yeah. not quite there yet. <laughs> no, but I, it, it's a yeah, it, it it's it's funny. I mean, ta talking with leaders about these different pieces, and I I love the vision of the future of and there's t been talk about, um, and I'm going to use old lingo to describe it, mm -hmm. uh, but like the. Uh, where AI will work as like a service bus across multiple AI different platforms. So I can actually use my Amazon or Google device sitting in my window and I won't say her name because she'll wake up over there, but to go and do very complex things that are cross cloud, cl cross yeah, platform, yeah, yeah. leveraging different steps. I mean, a lot of what I want to do, um, I was talking with the person who's out building different bots and like 10 mm -hmm. years ago built you know a chat bot that's with the, in the healthcare industry and, Yep. And doing some really cool things. I said, yeah. I said, what I really want, because uh, there's still a lot of work. It, yeah, does it save me a lot of time? Yes, for repeatable tasks. But I right. want it to do the next step, which is, yeah. you know, when this happens is a trigger and that level of automation where it go kicks off multiple things that then go in and happen. And there's just, there's pieces missing. APIs are not yet there. It's not yep. two way. Yep. I mean, kind of all these different things. But that idea of where it's going, I believe like OpenAI is talking about exactly that. Of oh, yeah. oh, yeah. It to be able to recognize and leverage multiple instances of itself mm -hmm. as well as other engines, other AI models entirely. Like yeah. that is exciting. Yeah, yeah, it is exciting. And, um, and you know, like you said, the, the, it, it's very exciting. And when it gets here, it'll be really i mean it's exciting and scary right you're yeah. anxious about it too right so um but yeah and it is it, it's it's getting there it's like the things it can do for us are are impressive yeah you know well my final question for you um any advice for business leaders who really want to harness the power of metrics to drive that organizational momentum stay competitive increase the speed of their innovation like how can people get started? What should they do to get started? Yeah, what you should do to get started is look at your own data and make sure it, you know it's there and it fits and it's as good as you think it is. Or, or if you know it's not good, like look at that. 
uh, and then like, and then talk to somebody and, and get involved. Like I said, I'm big, you know, get involved type person. So get involved, dig in. Um, it's there. You know, I worked for a company years and years and years ago who, who, um, you know, one of their big things was we can make all kinds of metrics as long as we have, you know, four or five really good metrics that are based that are, that are, you know, unassailable, the quality is excellent. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it's true. You can derive a lot of things off of things like that. So, um, you know, I, my, but my big thing is always get involved. Don't hire some consultant to come in and do it for you, you know, work with them. You know, that's yeah. my, that's one of the things I will always say. One thing that I always liked is I, so I did my MBA while working for the phone mm -hmm. company and I, every project, every paper where mm -hmm. I could, I applied it to the work that I was doing. So I was able yeah. to, you know, and that's something that you can actually do if you're learning about these different tools, technology, you have different mm -hmm. people on your, in your organization, you yeah. send them through this training, say, do it, but leverage what you're learning there, yeah. apply it to the project. So it's exactly. real world. Uh, mm -hmm. And you'll learn more about that and learn more about your data from in, getting in there and doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Definitely agree with that. So. Well, Alex, really appreciate your time. It's great, yeah, great conversation. You. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.